closely. Those are the symptoms of the infection on Mother Base. The blisters on the body were full of tiny worms. Parasite larvae, most likely. But we couldn't find any adults. It doesn't seem to mature in the body, like a sparganum. We don't know the root of infection, or what causes symptoms to develop. The infection rate, along with the number of dead, are both on the rise. If we don't find the cause, and soon... Fox, do you remember seeing these symptoms before? The bodies floating around in the oil facility? The bedridden test subjects at the Devil's House? This epidemic looks just like what we've seen on our hunt for Cypher. It could be a counterplay by Skullface. That's insane. You mean they weaponize parasites? Parasites as weapons. That definitely falls under the Biological Weapons Convention. But it's something the world would never see coming. And no one's ever developed a vaccine for parasites. So this is the weapon of mass destruction Cypher was working on in Africa? It may be. But if it is, how did the yellow cake and walker gears fit in? There must be something bigger we're not seeing. Anyway, our priority now is to prevent more casualties. The medical team is studying the infection, but we can't treat anyone until we know the root cause. All we can do right now is halt the spread of infection. Remember before, boss, when Quiet attacked one of our guys on Mother Base, stuck a knife in his mouth. He's one of the very few soldiers who've had contact with her recently. Close contact. I don't think it's a coincidence that he was among those who became symptomatic pretty early on in this epidemic. Saliva and blood spatter, an open wound, mucosal infection. Whatever is causing this got inside him then. Miller, that is a baseless accusation. The source of the infection is quiet. Everyone suspects her. We don't know that. And we've come across these symptoms before. The bodies in the water at the oil field facility. Those sick people in the beds at the Devil's House. They're identical to what we've seen while we've been after Cypher. The infection could have come from elsewhere. But at the very least, she does know something. <laughs> it's not like she's gonna talk. No, not through words, anyway. But what about her actions? Quiet held a knife to that soldier back then, before he became symptomatic. There must have been a reason for that. A reason for shoving a knife down the throat of one of our men. What if she's capable of identifying who's infected? What if she was trying to stop the infection but couldn't communicate that to us? The answer to that, the source of the infection, might be in the mouths of the infected. You think there's some kind of clue in their mouths? I don't know. But maybe there's something about the mouths of those who've become symptomatic, something in common. Something their mouths have in common. Forget it. We can't trust her. Even if she can spot the infected, I don't want her help. I understand how you feel. But this is something to go on. Can't you see it's just like I said? Bringing her here was a big mistake. Quiet is gonna be the end of us. Stand down. You've got zero proof. Try to keep an open mind on this, boss. There has to be a way to identify who's infected. White Mamba. Nyokayam Pembe. He's the commander of the kids based out of Wale Yamasa. As you know, contract forces of Africa were stationed at that village. Anti-government forces hired CRS to bring kids there from around Africa for training. But at some point, the adults with the PF started dropping like flies. This was right after we arrived in Africa. We don't know the cause. The kids ended up on their own. Must have been like fish out of water. Nothing to eat, no way to get back home. All the adults taught them was how to use a gun. Sure, they could shoot targets, but hunt for food? Not likely. They wouldn't have lasted long. Then the White Mamba showed up. He was faster and stronger than them, a better soldier, and he knew how to lead. I guess somebody wished upon a star, because their savior turned up like stardust straight out of the blue. The moment he arrived, the kids had their new commander. That was when they started attacking other villages. Word of the infamous White Mamba spread fast. But it isn't just his combat skills that got people talking. As you can tell from the name, he's the only light-skinned kid in the unit. 
Not to mention the blonde hair and the blue eyes. Not common in those parts. We have no idea where he came from or what he's experienced. The kid's a huge blank. But I'm sure you'll know him when you see him. One other thing. He's still a kid, so don't kill him. Be careful not to hit him with anything lethal. Not even a flesh wound. Our mission objective isn't just suppressing a bunch of militants. This is a DDR operation of the kids in that unit. DDR stands for disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. Disarmament is obvious. We take their weapons off their hands. The demobilization part means dismantling their military organization to ensure they can't arm themselves again. To do that, you need to capture the unit's commander and have him order his men to disband. In this case, the commander is the White Mamba. There's nobody above him, so he's all we need to grab. Finally, reintegration. Through education and occupational training, we give them a means to live besides war. A lot of kids born in a war zone don't know any other way to live. So before they find themselves back there, we teach them another skill. I'd like to establish this rehabilitation process at Mother Base. That's why we're bringing those kids back here. It's not so much for their sake. It's for the world that we're trying to create. No other way about it. Those kids are amateurs. Bad for business to have them running around where we're trying to work. Bring them all back if possible. Or as many as you can. We placed the White Mamba and the rest of his unit in the staff living quarters. How's that going? It's a disaster, but what else can we do? We've taken away his weapons and banned him from using his nom de guerre. Apparently his real name is Eli. He must feel like we stripped him of his whole identity. We'll let things simmer down. I put a guard on him for now. Still the question is, who is he? Where did he come from, and how has he survived? He's still not talking. No, he won't say a word about himself. But you know, it looks like he speaks English. One of the deck crew called out to him in English, and he said something back. He just lost it all of a sudden, started mouthing off at the guy, in perfect English. He wasn't stringing together words he picked up somewhere. So English is his mother tongue? He could be from the East, or the South, or maybe even further North or South. English is well established in countries all across the continent. It's rooted in Africa like a weed, or maybe parasite is the better word. So just speaking English doesn't help us figure out where he comes from. Could even be from off-continent. Right. In any case, we'll keep an eye on him. If we learn anything else, I'll be sure to let you know. About the pathogen spreading through Mother Base, you've seen everything we've got on the outbreak. What's your opinion? Textbook symptoms. A vocal cord parasite infestation. And judging from this casualty list, it is the Kikongo strain, meaning a breed of parasite that triggers symptoms upon detecting pronunciation specific to Kikongo. So our Kikongo-speaking staff are at risk? Quite so. Hmm. He's right. All the victims do speak Kikongo. So they can survive if they just use another language? There is no guarantee you're only dealing with the Kikongo strain. Other language strains may be present. You well know he was teaching them languages from all over the world. The Devil's House. In Zoya Badiabulu. There is no way to know how many strains he has at his disposal. So how do we keep them from becoming symptomatic? You mentioned using microbes. Use this. A type of Wolbachia, introduced to a sample of the parasite. Wolbachia? A parasitic bacteria that colonizes the parasites, turning male to female and preventing copulation. You must cultivate more. What have you done with the infected bodies? Cremated to stop the spread of infection, but we did keep a few for study. Good. Take this sample, grind it to a pulp, and introduce it to the larvae now nesting in the dead. The Volbachia will multiply rapidly within those larvae. They're soldiers, not some petri dish. Conventional cultivation methods will take too long. Extract the Volbachia from those larvae 
and vaccinate your men. Kikongo speakers first. This is the fastest, surest way. No one is to speak a word of Kikongo until the Bobakia are safely inside them. I will instruct your medical staff in detail on site. You have the appropriate facilities. Yes, but do not worry. I made a pact with your Bette Holone on the honor of the Dene. I speak no lies. Keep an eye on him. Will do. Follow me. I'll take you to the medical team. Now, we must wait for the Volbachia to multiply in the larvae. How is the disease transmitted? If it's carried by insects or rodents, then... There is no intermediate host. So... The vocal cord parasites lay their eggs in the larynx of the host. Most hatch and migrate to the lungs. But some are transported to the mouth through ciliary movement. Mixing in with saliva. Saliva. Droplet transmission. Sneezing, coughing. Any food or water containing infected saliva. It would spread fast. Indeed. And when the larvae migrate to the lungs, symptoms can resemble the early stages of a cold, making it easy to infect others. Meaning a simple conversation would be enough to pass it on. All right, so what happens after the larvae migrate to the lungs? It is as I said before. They mature by feeding on alveolar tissue. It is only then that noticeable symptoms appear in the host. And by that point, it's too late. He's infected everyone else. It's one hell of a weapon you've created. That is what Blag Anna wanted. Something that would spread easily. <sighs> in truth, he's not the reason. But we will discuss that another time. The Walbachia have multiplied. We're preparing to extract them and begin vaccinating. But is this really the only way? Sure, it'll prevent infection, but the cost... You would rather remove their vocal cords? No. Tactical communication's a linchpin of what we do. What if we were to ban the use of Kakongo? Insufficient. First, there is no guarantee that only the Kikongo strain is here. Second, there is the matter of how the parasites lay their eggs. Before they can copulate, they must be exposed to the pronunciation of a specific language for a period of time. Like a container filling with water. But the duration between when the container is full and when the copulation actually begins varies from case to case. In other words, even if the infected stops speaking as a countermeasure, it may already be too late. The only true solution is to prevent copulation through the obakia, or by physically removing the affected tissue. <sighs> Do any antiparasitics work? It sounds as though you have already tried. Yeah. We tried everyone there is, and nothing. I have yet to find a medicine that can remove the parasites. At best, it temporarily covers their ears. Why is that? Because the parasites are... companions to us. To remove them inevitably harms the host. Companions? More than you think. And this is why the human immune system cannot eliminate them. We've inoculated the staff with Walbachia to keep them from becoming symptomatic. Hmm. That should also contain the infection. How did this happen in the first place? It has to have been a cipher spy within our ranks. If this is so, then why the Kakango strain? If their intent was to wipe you out... Skullface said the remaining English parasite was close to the boss. 
If this latest strain was his doing, he wouldn't have tipped his hand. It is possible someone brought eggs onto the base without knowing. Stuck to their shoes, clothing. Well, that makes the most sense to me. And where did the eggs come from? You mentioned that your boss visited Nzoya Badiopulu. Sure, but his gears disinfected immediately upon return. Hmm. Then he was not the carrier. And not just the boss. All staff dispatched to high-risk regions were quarantined on the flight back. When the symptoms first appeared, we checked and disinfected all equipment used up to that point. Any and all prisoners, soldiers, materials, and animals extracted during missions were also quarantined. So, that just leaves. I have seen children around here. Where are they from? All over. Some were being held hostage at a mine. Then there were the troublemakers at Bwala Yamasa. Bwala Yamasa? Yeah. Their clothes, their things. Did you burn them? They're just kids. We couldn't. And besides, not one of them's shown symptoms. The parasites don't infect prepubescent hosts. Their vocal cords are not fully developed. Well, if infection doesn't occur in children... It is possible they carried eggs on their clothes. And the infection spread from them. Check the kid's stuff. I doubt there is any trace left by now. But if there is, some of those kids must be close to hitting puberty. How could we have missed this? The name Bwala Yamasa got quite a reaction from you. I'm guessing the Kakongo strain was released in that village. Cypher used that region to experiment with vocal cord parasite transmission. The Kakongo strain. The settlements around the refinery upstream of Bwala Yamasa were the proving grounds. They would infect one villager and record transmission speed. Dangerous work. If they failed to contain the infection, it would slip into the surrounding regions. At which point the world found out about the parasites, making them useless as a weapon. Incredible they'd risk such a thing. The test site was densely populated too. A terrible place for such experiments. No doubt, they thought burning everything would wipe away all traces. The settlements were covered in oil anyway. Who would wonder if one day they caught fire? And so it did. They burned it all. Living and dead. Those remains. But they miscalculated. Transmission speed was far faster than anticipated. It may have been the temperature, or hygiene standards, or perhaps the parasites reacted quickly to Kikongo. Whatever the reason, nearly all villages were swiftly infected and the settlements reduced to mounds of corpses. Making matters worse, the dry season was ending. When it came time to burn the village, the Moneni River had swelled. Many of the bodies were waterlogged. Meaning they didn't burn completely. The corpses still contained viable eggs, and the larvae washed downstream. And when the people downstream drank that water, that marked the end for Bwala Yamasa. I learned all of this at the mansion. I warned him of the risk of eggs getting out. And? We are prepared for any eventuality. I get it. Mm. Putting the oil field back online, the oil leaks, saner. They plan to pollute the river, prevent the spread of infection. But the oil flow was stopped. At downstream, the people of Masa village started using the water again. The PF soldiers deployed at the village were locals, spoke Kikongo. They were infected, and the kids survived. I've heard enough. And who stopped the flow of oil? Don't. We did. <sighs> that confirms it. The source of the Kikongo strain infection was Masa village. 
and the children brought it here. It is no one's fault. There is no blame to be cast. The parasites, they were tested in other regions? Their physiology requires that they be tested under varied conditions. Another test site was in Afghanistan. So it was the parasites there. Both the Pashto and Tajik languages are spoken in the mountains of Afghanistan. And population density is low. Ideal testing grounds for how accurately the parasites target only the specified language. It is also relatively easy to prevent the spread of infection. And the results? The first test, I am told, was a success. Once the Pashtun Mujahideen were infected with the Pashto strain, they were all but wiped out. The Hamid fighters is my safe fort. It was doubly successful. No Tajik Mujahideen or Soviet soldiers became symptomatic. So the parasites proved to be effective. What about the second test? Also supposedly a success. A Pashtun village was the target. However, the original aim was to obtain samples of the infected. In this, they failed. And the village? The Soviets enacted a standard scorched earth operation. That must have been the village where Malak lived, before being held captive at Lamarhate Palace. Having had more time Caution to think on it, approaching. the details shared with me may have been false. They are madmen who would do anything to cover up the truth. They certainly seem to like tossing their problems in the fire. As a boy, Skullface's life went up in flames. Perhaps that is what fuels his fixation with fire. Your well Bakia stopped the infection all right, but I still don't get it. How can a few bacteria change males to females? I know they're only bugs, but... It is not such a rare thing in the natural world. Many insects and nematodes are infected with Bulbachia. But why? They nest in the cell cytoplasm of the host. Even in the egg cells. With the result that the offspring are born infected. Mother to child transmission. However, Bulbachia cannot nest in sperm because they do not have cytoplasm. So even a successful infection of a male ends after a single generation. This means the Volbachia must resort to maximizing the population of infected females. Sounds like an ethnic cleansing campaign on a tiny scale. Gender change from male to female is their survival tactic. So more females means more Waldbachia carriers, so it can keep thriving in the following generations. But the parasites in a human host are supposed to be a mating pair. If there's no male, there'll be no offspring at all. It's killing itself. Slow down. This tactic is intended for environments where a single male can copulate with multiple females. Originally, the Wolbachia did not infect the vocal cord parasites. I created a mutated strain, modifying the Wolbachia so that it could infect monogamous pairs. The Wolbachia's greatest multiplying tactic, the male to female change, worked against itself in the monogamous parasites. Just as you said, then I performed repeated selection of Wolbachia strains until I achieved a hundred percent certainty of male to female conversion. Creating female-female pairs, unable to reproduce. And you say the Wolbachia affects the host of the host, that is, us, cutting off our means to reproduce? It is almost certain. Of course, we will not turn female. After all, mammals possess no natural gender-changing function. But some Wolbachia strains can cause 
cytoplasmic incompatibility in the host. Is that some cell deformity? Put simply, it means the altered sperm of infected males kill the female's egg on contact. And that's happened to us? Yes. And yet, what occurs in humans is not just simple CI. To date, there are no cases of Volbachia affecting humans. Mm. The fact that this strain causes this effect, is it the vocal cord parasite's affinity with humans? Mm. I do not know enough to say for sure. So the parasite warps the host. Reminds me of what Skullface said. It is the way of all organisms to create their own optimal environment. Just look at you and this space. Organisms that cannot do this are doomed to extinction. The difference with parasites is that their environment is another organism. That creates a connection between life and life. Parasitism, symbiosis, or death. In this way, the hose, too, is challenged to adapt. About this OKB-0 Emmerich was talking about. Its location and features match the citadel in the mountains northeast of the Soviet base camp. Built during the time of Alexander the Great, it was left in ruins following one of Genghis Khan's campaigns. Its occupants changed time and again due to war, and it was expanded on more than one occasion. Ultimately, it fell into the hands of the Soviet philosophers. The Soviet army was using it as the headquarters of its Afghan invasion force. But it would seem that Skullface's connection with the philosophers gave him license to develop Sahelanthropus there. And that's what Emmerich was doing at the place, before he got the axe. But OKB is a designation the Soviets use for weapon design bureaus. There's no way they'd have one of those in Afghanistan. And, in principle, the numbers that follow OKB are always integers above one. There is no zero. Perhaps this was a secret facility of the Soviet and Chinese philosophers dating back prior to World War II. Though it's more likely Skullface just picked a fake name that more or less fit the Soviet's pattern. They doesn't go there often, but he sure as hell won't miss this. They use the heliport on top of the tower for his visits. Start by heading for the heliport. Then wait for your chance to make contact with Skullface. It seems Sahelanthropus' armor is made from depleted uranium. That offers some serious protection. The U.S. military is planning on using it for its main battle tanks, too. Maybe that's where Emmerich got the technology. Uranium? They're using nuclear fuel for armor now? No. What they use for nuclear fuel is uranium-235, which is extracted from natural uranium. Depleted uranium is a byproduct of that process. Sort of like the leftovers, I guess. The garbage. Uranium-235 makes up 0.72% of natural uranium, whereas depleted uranium contains only 0.2%. What are the benefits of using it for armor? It's a pretty short list. Uranium's a heavy metal, like lead, meaning it can hold a greater amount of kinetic energy. But it also boasts a hardness closer to tungsten. That makes it an ideal material to use for, say, armor-piercing ammunition penetrators. But it's not the best choice for armor. Its volume is less than that of ceramics, but for an equal weight, you could end up with less protection. So why use it then? According to Emmerich, it came down to him being unable to source ceramics technology from a manufacturer. Plus, given that it's an upright walking vehicle, he wanted to reduce the bulk of certain areas. Despite all that, depleted uranium still makes for some tough armor. And Emmerich says it's been proven in live fire tests. It stops most Soviet tank shells. Code Talker. What are the metallic archaea? Volcanic craters spewing sulfur. Water hot enough to boil your skin off. Ocean depths of 800 plus atmospheres. Wastelands radioactive enough to kill you where you stand. 
There are groups of organisms that survive this fight. No. Because of living in such environments. I've heard about them. Extremo... something. Extremo files. By selecting certain species, then subculturing and repeatedly modifying them, I created a metallic offspring of pure Archaea. They subsist on metals rather than organic matter. And some of them even consume uranium? Yes. Uranium enrichment Archaea metabolize only uranium-235. As a result, they produce weapons-grade enriched uranium. How is that possible? Consider how plants fractionate carbon isotopes when they conduct photosynthesis. Nature possesses abilities beyond our imagination. So, it was Archaea that brought down your chopper? Corrosive Archaea, yes. They oxidize metals, feeding off the energy in the electrons they receive. What became of the wreckage? We had the R&D team retrieve samples for study in... Uh, airtight plastic containers, of course. Prudent. We shall extract Archaea from it in good time. They should help you fight back against Blanca Anna. Any chance we could start now? It doesn't have to be a lot. I might just have another use for them. If it's only a small amount you need. That's fine. I'll get the R&D team to assist. Let's go. South Africa was previously suspected of developing nuclear weapons. It already had a conspicuous presence at the UN because of apartheid and its armed expansionism. But when neighboring Angola and Mozambique became socialist countries in 74, South Africa felt hounded into a corner. So it accelerated its nuclear program to protect itself. Three years later, the Soviets discovered a test facility. And two years after that, an American satellite observed a flash in the southern Indian Ocean. It said this was South Africa conducting a nuclear test with the help of a certain ally. Skullface used the situation in South Africa to get this ally to lend a hand. They both wanted nukes, so it was a mutually beneficial relationship. On the surface, anyway. I figure South Africa started getting serious about nuclear weapons production in 75. In 74, the government was still able to get by with bluffing that it had a nuclear arsenal. But the year after? Word spread that an independent armed group in the Caribbean was crushed by Cypher for possessing a WMD. That's right, boss. What happened to you and your men was the reason South Africa decided to push ahead with nuclear development. A force independent of any country getting its hands on a nuke. That was a threat to the existence of countries everywhere. It wasn't just South Africa. Your presence pushed a lot of countries to get nukes. The world was scared of you. You were a threat to more than just the Cold War. If nations are gears in a machine, you had the power to smash them loose and watch the whole world grind to a halt. Emmerich uses externally powered legs of his own design. It's bionics technology, a product of the U.S. military's failed attempt to develop a powered exoskeleton. All the wearer has to do is apply a little force, and the actuators continue the movement in that direction. But his legs are unique. Instead of using a hydraulic mechanism, the actuators run off metallic archaea. That increases the actuator's reaction speed and also enables him to lock and release the joints at will. The legs are a nifty little gadget, but they have two clear weaknesses. First, they're dependent on external power. Maybe because he built them knowing he couldn't leave his lab. There's no internal battery. That's why they won't work if they aren't plugged in. Second, and this is more than just a weakness, the legs are directly connected to his bones. Could be to minimize signal loss and the order's output to the legs and the drive response from them. Either way, Emmerich has used bolts to attach load-bearing parts directly to his femurs, probably by mimicking surgical treatment for compound fractures and the like. 
but the end result is those legs and his body are fused together. And that appears to be how he's able to move them so precisely. But that also means that any shock to the legs would be delivered right to his bones by way of those bolts. The same is true if he encounters the corrosive metallic archaea. If the corrosive archaea ate into the exposed bolts, they'd reach the endoskeleton parts and eat through them too in the blink of an eye. The doctor's bones are full of holes to accommodate all the bolts. They're like sponges. If he were to lose the reinforcing parts, even the tiniest bit of force or weight would snap his bones. So when I dangled those corrosive metallic archaea in front of him, he realized straight away what would happen. Life wouldn't be worth living if he lost those legs of his. I'd bet that is what the doctor fears the most. I just helped him imagine what it would be like. Thanks to that, I got the information we needed without either of us getting hurt. You know how he is. He's probably already over the shock. The better you know your adversary, the easier it is for you to get information from them. And vice versa.